Our Father and our God, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Again, thankful for that access, thankful for thy word. Father, may the Holy Spirit just take this time, filter out the air, but seal to our hearts that which is true. We're keenly aware of just how little we know and how powerful are the forces against the truth. We long to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse. And on our last study together, we left off at verse 15 of the second chapter. So I'll begin at verse 16. The Holy Spirit has beautifully presented to us the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the reasons, primary reasons why I just absolutely adore this epistle. Chapter 1 closed by saying that we preach and admonish every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And I suggested to you how that I, I don't believe the Holy Spirit expects us to just fill in the blanks as to what that admonishing, you know, is to be, but that rather we have an outline of that teaching in the rest of the epistle. We saw that it was the concern of the Holy Spirit that we know the comfort of God, that we know the entirety of the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And we're now looking at that completeness. We are complete with respect to the body of sin. We see in the text that we are complete with respect to our identification with Christ. We're, we're complete with respect to the forgiveness of sin. We are complete with respect to the law. We are complete with respect to Satan and his hordes. And so the 16th verse is telling us, because these things are true, then let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. And right away, I find myself struck blind by the fact of what the text does not say. It doesn't say, let no man therefore judge you as in matters pertaining to the flesh, such as, you know, such as, well, just fill in the blanks. You know, drinking, smoking, playing poker, going fishing on Sunday. But rather those things which pertain to what when, uh, most of us would call religious observances. Don't be in the habit of being put under condemnation or ruled over. You've been called to liberty. Of course, you don't use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but one of the great occasions to the flesh that seems to be almost entirely overlooked by the preaching community is the reversion to law, back to law, going, falling from grace back into law. It is absolutely ingrained into Christian thinking that, you know, an occasion to the flesh, you know, is adultery, fornication, robbery, you know, cheating on your income tax, you know, painting your toenails, drinking liquor, liquor you know, drinking moonshine, you know, smoking cigarettes. I don't know. Put in your own. Few Christians seem to realize that one of the greatest occasions of the flesh, the, the violation of the liberty that is theirs, in our Lord Jesus Christ is falling back into law keeping as a rule of life. Don't be in the habit of being put under condemnation because these things are but a dim shadow of that which is to come. The body is of Christ, that is, the source is Christ. The ownership belongs to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. The nourishment comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. And the result of that nourishment and that growth being, you know, 
fruit. The unity is in Christ. Galatians 3.29 If you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? So intimately, are you identified with Christ that when God speaks of Christ, He includes you? The completeness is of Christ. In the 18th verse, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. That's what my text says. If we look at that in the Greek, the word beguile, you know, is an interesting word. You see it in the 15th verse of the third chapter as well as the 18th verse of the second chapter. The text says, don't let anyone acting as an umpire rule you unsafe, rule you out, to, to put it in baseball language. Don't let them rule you out. Whereas verse 15 says, let the peace of God rule you safe. Technically, it would say in verse 18, don't let anyone rule against you as an umpire. And in the 15th verse of the third chapter, let the peace of God rule for you as an umpire. Don't let anyone act as an umpire ruling against you. My Bible says, rob you of your reward. Since the language appears to be that of an umpire, and, uh, and there was a reward coupled with the judge at the Greek games, then the translators have included that, the concept of reward in this ruling against you. And I think that that's probably you know, proper to do that. Don't lose sight of the fact the Holy Spirit is saying. Don't let any man rule against you in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. And that is an interesting idiom. The word angel means messenger. Now, this is close to the, you know, uh, I'd suggest that it's, it's closely connected with the voluntary humility. I mean, there's no doubt, folks, in our minds, none, there shouldn't be any doubt whatsoever, that angels are ministering spirits. We know that from numerous accounts in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We should all agree on the fact that Christ had, has, absolute superiority in respect to all angels who are but ministering spirit spirits sent forth to minister to them that uh, those who are heirs to salvation. We see the prohibition of angel worship in Revelation chapter 22. Uh, See thou, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. Worship God says the angel. But I, I do not believe that this is limited to an, angelic beings, the angelic host. I believe it includes human messengers because that's what the word means, messengers. Given the fact that the angelic ministry to men is, is, is a fact, is true, well, we really can't separate the two. Our present text is addressing a believer's worship of messengers without any question. And what I see the Holy Spirit saying here is that this person has willed, that the word voluntarily indicates it's that, he, the, that person has willed personal debasement, personal humility, and in that humility worships messengers rather than God Almighty. I'm going to suggest to you that uh, I'm going to suggest that you or I can exercise a self-willed false humility in not worshiping like others do. You know, I mean, I'll, 
I will simply say, and, and in my position, I guess I'm supposed to say, that you know you are in a terrible shape if you see me as the final voice on any matter. What I believe the idiom, the, that idiom is saying, that phrase is saying, is that by an exercise of the will, we come up with a humility that is not genuine, and we begin to respect more, actually worship the messenger more than the head of the body, which we see as our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you're a follower of Bullinger, you're a follower of, of Spurgeon or Barnhouse or Billy Graham or, or heaven forbid, Stephen Sewell. Rather than resting upon the results of your own labor in this book, you take your stand up on someone else's work and revere them probably more than you should. I, I personally can recall uh, years, many years ago, uh, telling someone something. Uh, and what I believe the, the text to be saying, and they said, well, I don't know about that. I, 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 and that's Steve, I'm not sure about that. I, I need to go ask my pastor. This is what I'm talking about. You take your stand up on someone else's work and you revere them probably more than you ought to. And I believe that the Christian community is more at fault than any other single factor in ruining ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, you don't have to tell me that I'm good very often before I'm willing to believe that. You know, if you'd like to look at me as the most outstanding Bible teacher that ever, you know, walked the face of the earth, be my guest. You know, I'd like you to do that. But of course, it's not true. And it's not true in any man's life. We know from 1 Corinthians 8, 2, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. You know, I, th I think that many uh, Christians feel that they're just serving the Lord in their weak way. You know, when they're not, and that many are, feel that they're serving the Lord in a, in a great way, a greater way than what others are, and both of, uh, assume a position which is contrary to the very argument of our text right here, that we are all complete in Christ. And you need to realize that it's true of you and not take a position based upon false logic, which in fact separates you from the, the fellowship and the communion that it is your right through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't allow any man to rule against that completeness. And that through a humility that comes from a, a self-willed worship of messengers, I believe the word angels there can include more than just heavenly messengers, but human messengers as well. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Man, it's, it's, it's folks, it's difficult to establish the not, you know, when you look at the Greek. You know, there's some manuscripts that include it, but by far, in a way, the overwhelming evidence says that the knot is not there. Intruding into those things which you have seen, clearly discerned, the word see is, means clearly discerned in your experience. The word intruding is, is, uh, is one that we could translate, taking a firm stand upon those things which you have seen. That, that's the existentialist. You know, the brother or sister, you know, who believes that the only true uh, perception of truth comes from their own personal experience. You know, when, when studying your own personal experiences is, is basically tantamount, is tantamount to studying error. I have stated repeatedly there is but one source of truth, and that's this book. And the fact that I, I'm, I might not understand it and may not comprehend it in no way changes the fact that it is God's Word. And it's my exercise to try to study it, to know it better, to know it more, to live in it, to feast upon it, 
that I might know what God has revealed. No experience, no thought, you know, such as, you know, well, I think, and, you know, I hear that phrase all the time, stands as an argument against the truth of this book. It's a sobering thought, folks, when, when one thinks of all of everything that's ever been written, all the periodicals, newspapers, all the books, everything that's been engraved on tablets, all the books that's published year after year, all the websites, all the blogs, all the comments, everything, and whatever else that's read and analyzed. You know, when we have one source of truth, the Word of God, which, which is rarely even looked at. Taking a firm stand upon those things, vainly being puffed up by his fleshly mind is what the Greek says. The word vainly, uh, I think you'll find it in, in several of, of the more recent translations, puffed up without a cause, without a reason. You know, which many of you know can be pr pretty frustrating. You know, when you find yourself debating these truths with, with others, or that they give you these reasons for their beliefs and, and you understand completely that those are not reasons because they just, it, it, you know, they made it up. They don't make any sense. There's no logic in that kind of reasoning. That's the word, puffed up in his carnal fleshly mind without a cause, without any reason, without any solid base. You don't want to, you don't want to puff up the fleshly mind. You want to puff up the spiritual. You have a mind of the flesh. We know that we have a mind of the flesh, which is God's enemy, Romans eight seven, uh, Romans eight seven and eight. It cannot please God. It does not please God. It 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 will not please God. It'll never please God. And you have a mind of the Spirit, which I firmly believe can do nothing but please God. You have a mind of the Spirit, which has the will of God. He's given you of His Spirit. That's the one that we build up, not the mind of the flesh. And it's, it's interesting that this ruling against you is not in the areas where, you know, we would expect. You know, if it, had I been writing the text, you know, I would have said, don't let anybody rule against you in the way that you pay your taxes and the way you obey the speed limit and all those, you know, uh, all those other things. And those things, those are important things. But what was important to the Holy Spirit here was that you understand the, the thesis that's been presented that you are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you, you don't need to do anything to ensure that completeness. But it's a finished reality in your relationship with God through the person and the work of Christ. The reason verse 18 can happen is because they don't hold the head from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. The problem with the 18th verse is that they didn't hold fast to the head. And I've stated, I don't know, probably hundreds of times through these studies that it's not about us, it's about Christ. I've talked about the finished work of Christ. You know, I've really tried to impress upon you the reality of the loveliness of Christ, the, the the picture of Christ, it's Christ over self, it's Christ, 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 Christ. And folks, I've never stated it more beautifully than what the Holy Spirit does here. Holding fast to the head. That's what we've been fellowshipping over. That's what we've been talking about. That's what we've been talking about on Facebook. That's what we've been talking about in our daily lives. Holding fast to the head. It is all about Christ. I find it thrilling that the Holy Spirit is so precise. I am not to be led astray from my looking at the position of completeness that I have in Christ 
You know, we have a personal relationship. Our lives are hid with Christ and God. We're complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And the problem with reverting to law, human works, human effort, is not holding fast to our, to our Lord Jesus Christ, to the head. And I see a great number of Christians who are afraid to stand on the fact that God is not imputing their trespasses against them, that He's forgiven them of all sin, forgiven them of all trespasses. They're buried in the deepest sea, cast as far as the east is from the west, sought for and not found, forgiven, washed as white as snow, remembered no more. God has gone to great lengths to purchase for us liberty and completeness in Christ. And it seems as though the Christian community makes every effort to turn away from those provisions that God has made for us and does so through man's logic, man philosophy, human philosophy, man's wisdom, man's mind, not holding fast to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's from the Lord Jesus Christ. To me, it is precious to see here that the Holy Spirit has articulated this. The body by joints and bands. Folks, God knows those who are His. God knows the members of His body. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. And yet the Holy Spirit writes back, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. <clears throat> Folks, He's branded my name on the palms of His hands. He lights my candle. That, that means that He lights my path. He knows the way that I take, and when He's tested me, I will come forth as gold. He's promised that that's, that is, I don't have to, to question the reality of that fact, He's made that to me as a promise. He holds me in the hollow of His hand. No man shall pluck me out of His hands. He knew me before the foundation of the world. Then He knows me by name. You know, Trump doesn't know me by name. The, the Queen of England doesn't know me by But God knows me by name. And I praise God that the joints and the ligaments are known to God. When I look at the body of uh, Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, from my vantage point, you know, it looks pretty bad. It looks pretty unhealthy. In fact, it looks quite a mess. You know, it looks poorly clothed, poorly fed, incomplete, you know, in, all in disarray, in total disunity, not in unity. You know, kind of like the, you know, America today, just totally divided. But the body of Christ is a living organism scattered from one end of the earth to the other. It's not strictly brick and mortar or corrugated steel, you know, or cardboard jacks. The body of Christ is these joints and ligaments. There's, there is nothing wrong with the church of God, folks. It's alive and well. But it's been called to come out from and be separate from a world religious system based on human merit. Let no man rule against you, robbing you of what God says is yours in Christ. You know, the, the prayer that Christ prayed was answered. Lord, I pray that they'll be one as we are one and we are. You know, it might not look like it from your vantage point, but, but it, it is Having nourishment ministered, both of these are, are, are present passive participles. That means that 
It's a continuing process, an unbroken process. The passive voice says that it has an outside operator, and the participle says its action is concurrent with the main verb. It grows with God's growth. It, go it grows with God's growth. I, I just I want to repeat those words a thousand times, but it, this, that would make for an awful long video. Folks, it grows with God's growth. You know, if listen, if you're going to be a street minister or a pastor or a missionary or, or start a YouTube ministry because you love the Lord Jesus Christ, because you want to be used by Him in, in, in some way, in any way, in the nourishment and the growth of the body of Christ, then by all means do it. But if you think that God can't do it without you, that you've got to do it, Well, then go and do something else. I am constantly reminded my, myself that this ministry is a privilege. If it all stopped tomorrow, I would not think for one second that the church of God was going to suffer because of it. As sure as the text means anything, folks, the body is known to Christ. The individual parts of that body are known to Him. And those individual parts are being nourished so that the whole body grows. It's a present active indicative. It, it does indeed really, seriously, certainly, absolutely grow. And you couldn't stop its growth any more than you, you could have stopped the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be privileged to be used by Almighty God in that growth, but you are not necessary for that growth. It does grow. Oh, but the verse is not done. It grows with God's growth. It grows with God's growth. Wow, I thought it was... I thought it was... It grew with my growth. Not only did... You know, we have a mixed multitude come up out of Egypt, but, you know, we have the same mess in what we see from our vantage point of Christianity in the church. It's, it's called the Church of Christ. But I praise God from God's standpoint that He knows those who are His. But every one of those He's purchased with, with the price of His Son, they are His, they will grow, you know, I can't say, oh, oh, I wish they'd grow. Oh, I wish they'd grow faster. You know, I wish they knew more. You know, I may say those things, but I am brought up short by this book, folks. They will grow, and they will grow with God's growth. The problem is, I want them to grow with my growth. My, you know, I want the church to be the way I think it ought to be. I want believers to think the way I think. I want them to follow the the theology that I think they ought to follow. And the problem with that is that we become a select group of believers who think that, you know, that we have some kind of a hold on truth or a hold on fellowship or a hold on organization. We who understand these marvelous truths of grace can become legalistic ourselves. In fact, folks, I, I've always believed that those who are the most under grace can be the most legalistic Christians of all if we're not careful. Contradicting the very message that we carry. We are simply a group of believers who have become separated from that world religious system. So we're gathered here on this channel to study, to worship, because we hold fast to the head. Yet Christ has His people in those very places that we left. We depart from the error, false doctrine. It's not Christians, you know, uh, that, who have been beguiled that we hate, but that world system based on human merit that does not hold fast to the head. That's what we don't want anything to do with. We don't want anything to do with error. Our text says every genuine child of God here or there or anywhere else is growing with the growth of God. That's what the text is teaching us. 
It is a question of fellowship, growth, and reward, not redemption. Remember that Moses died in the wilderness. You know, he wasn't allowed to enter the promised land. Yet he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. Same is true with Bema. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. If any man's entire life's work is burnt up, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. We're talking about matters of peace, joy, rest, freedom from guilt, freedom from fear, deliverance, the deliverance issue, the being delivered from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and the fear of death. Folks, the weakest believer in the faith will come forth as gold. Why? Because God said He would. Because God is faithful. God is faithful. That's where our primary focus should always be, on the faithfulness of God. Not my, my focus shouldn't be on your lack of faith. Your focus shouldn't be on the lack of faith that you, you seem to, to have in yourselves. Our focus is on God's faithfulness always. That's where the peace, the rest, the joy resides. Folks, the burden of this ministry is more than I'd want to bear if I felt that it, it, it would grow with the growth that, that it, it could only grow with the growth that somehow I might somehow supply. But I have the promise of the Word of God that it grows with the growth of God. I find it comforting how that the 19th verse absolutely gives you no right to believe that the 18th verse is going to win. Okay? It's a shame when some of God's children allow themselves to be ruled over. Yet in that condition, they're still growing with God's growth. But wouldn't it be wonderful if they knew that? I want you to understand that it's not yours and it's not my plans. And your ministry or these videos it's it's an assured growth and it comes from God let no man beguile that is umpire rule you out of your reward in a voluntary self-willed humility and worshiping of messengers whether they be angelic or human intruding into those things which he hath clearly seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind which is the enemy of God and not holding fast to the head. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.